We are so grateful to know each other, to be a part of each other, to know that we are a forever family together. Thank you for the promises that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the love that you have put in our hearts for each other and for you. Thank you that you shared with us the truth. To that end, we give you praise and glory and honor in the name of Jesus. We ask, Father, for healing, for there are some in our number that are physically needing healing. We ask also for healing for those who are suffering spiritually. Some are torn between whether to trust Christ or not trust Christ, whether to go on in a culture that does not believe Christ, that does not hold the Christian values, whether to go on in that and take a stand that will be one that uh, roughs them up pretty good, or to bow to the culture. Give them courage, Father. Grant them strength. Grant them the fullness of the Spirit. Some are going through pain, Father, because of relationships that are hurt or broken or that are breaking. Soften our hearts, Father, that the hardness that keeps us from understanding one another, living with one another, loving one another, and caring for one another, that might be put aside from us, that we might be a people fully forgiven, fully accepting others in the same way we have been accepted. Thank you for the kindness that you've shown to us every day. We ask now that as we go into the Word of God, you'll give us good understanding and a good uh, knowledge of who you are, and a commitment to you. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday, I got to go to uh, Life Summit for Churches for Life. And I think the, the longer I, I am alive and thinking, how are we doing this? How bloodthirsty do we have to become? How much do we want to do in our own offspring? to do in all kinds of people? How long will we keep on being at tension with one another all the time and finding out what, what, who's the next victim and what's the next victim class? Brothers and sisters, the call to the gospel of Jesus Christ is a call to forgiveness. It's a call to reconciliation. It's a call to all people everywhere. It's a call for us all to know the fullness of the living God. And as I look at it, I think sometimes, what's the matter with people? And then I go back and review. We're not any different people than we've been from the beginning. We are the same people. Uh, we, we have been given opportunity to know God, and sometimes even those who know God don't respond to him as if he is the God of heaven and earth, still living our own ways. How did all that happen? How is it that the Bible talks about and I know their hearts are really moving toward me. Today, they're my people. Today, they're going to do everything because they know they're going to get to go to a RSV and the ESV on this one because they followed the older texts. They followed the ones that were more accurate. They followed the Septuagint, and they followed the uh, before Christ. And that's the ones they have followed in their understanding of this passage. So, um, what I'm going to be reading to you in a few moments may be different than what you have in your lap, unless you have an ESV with you. If you have, it'll be exactly what you have. Um, now, you say, well, do you mean we're, we're all supposed to change right now? No. I hope that as a student of the Word of God, you are looking at as many different English translations as you can. Why? Anybody here ever done translation work? Translation work is not easy work. It is hard work. You have to put your mind right with the person who, is, who had written it at the time and see if you understand that person's language and that person's thoughts to be able to get it across. And sometimes one language doesn't say the same thing as another language does. So you have to find a way to say it. All of that depends on the texts that you're reading. There are Hebrew texts, there are Aramaic texts, there are Syrian texts, there are Greek texts. There are all kinds of texts that you have to look at. The Bible is the most attested book in the world. It has more manuscript evidence behind it and more opportunity for people to read it and say and have, even have their little arguments about what it says. This is a difficult book. This book is thousands of years old, and we have an English translation of it. By the way, English is not an inspired language. It just happens to be the one we speak. 
Everybody, everybody follow me here? So there are going to be some differences in what we get to look at. And the, the primary one is going to be found in verse 8 today uh, of Deuteronomy 32. But before we do, let me set it up from last week. Last week, what I tried to share with you was the battle has been about who will control the kingdom of God. The first battle that happened was a battle that happened in heaven. It was a transgression. It was the first of five transgressions that set, a, set things differently for us. That first transgression was when Satan said, I want to be God. I want to be up there. I want to be the one in charge of the kingdom of God. That was his fault. If he had left it there, we could deal, God could deal with him. That would be the end of it. But he did not leave it there. He brought it to earth. And bringing it to earth, he told Adam and Eve, you could also be like God's if you just disobey him and eat this particular fruit here. That started the second transgression. For Adam and Eve then decided they would be in charge of the kingdom of God. Well, then the battle went back toward heaven again, and the sons of God came. Obviously, the fall took place with that one, with Adam and Eve disobeying God. Then came Genesis 6, where heaven once again rebelled, and this time the sons of God, angelic beings, took on flesh and had wives among the daughters of men and uh, created a special breed of human being. It uh, wasn't even really human being. It was between the two of them that would have brought a corruption into the whole world. Matter of fact, it brought so much corruption in the world, God destroyed all of that one with a flood. Following the flood came the fourth transgression, which is the one we're going to be focusing attention on today. That fourth writing, okay, look, it didn't go well with us when we got along with the Elohim, those spirit beings. It has not gone well with us when we work with God. Let's have our own. We'll just do our own world. We'll just be our own authority. We'll do things the way we want to. And that's the Tower of Babel. So go to Genesis 11 with me just for a moment because I, want, I do want you to see how this conflict uh, lived its way out. Folks, we ought to always be spending our time so that we are familiar with the, the, the early books because those early books tell us how we got where we are. Uh, it's not just Western history we need to know. We need to know all the history of it. Genesis 11 said this, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. These are the people who left the flood. Okay? Now I'm, I'm going to share with you, this is about, if, if I can read right, about 40 years after the flood. Now follow what that means. This is happening 40 years, one generation, just 40 years from the time of the greatest catastrophe those eight people had ever known. There were millions of lives that had been lost in that great flood. It was a tremendous catastrophe. There were only eight of them left. And they began to have sons and daughters, and their sons and daughters, leaving that ark, went on a march to find a place to live and dwell. And within 40 years of the time that the, the flood had ended, they are doing this. Look what it says. Verse 3, or uh, verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone. They had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. You see that phrase, let us make a name? They were saying, we want to rival God. We wish to be our own gods, because that was the word that was used to speak of the name of the Lord. And rather than say Yehovah, you said Hashem. Hashem means the name. Rather than speak God's name, they would say Hashem. That's exactly what they said they wanted to do here. Let us create Hashem for ourselves. And this tower they were going to build was going to be the mountain of God. That was going to be their own mountain at the top of which would be their temple. And they would worship themselves. They would call down the gods to be with them. They would put the gods under them rather than being under the gods. You see the rebellion that's in it? This is within 40 years, kids. 40 years. Now, let's go further. But the Lord came down, or 
Yeah, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. They all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Now, let me go back and make sure that you get letter B in your outline. This is important to you. On letter A, you had who will control the kingdom of God. And once you get this picture, the long-suffering of God. That's what goes in that blank, the long-suffering of God. Now, here's, here's the deal. When God is creating people, when God is creating the Elohim, when God is creating the sons of God, he is creating them so that they can make choices. They're not just going to be robots. They are going to be beings that can make choices, and he's going to live with the choices they make. That's called the long-suffering of God. How do you know that God has worked with you over the years with long-suffering, that you have made some choices that probably were not the best choices? And rather than him stomp you in the ground, hit you with a lightning bolt, or run over you with a tank, he lets you live. That's called the long-suffering of God. So when, when you find people that want to fault God for letting this happen, understand that's his long-suffering that's doing that. That's the same stuff you're grateful for today that God was long-suffering with those who rebelled against him. He's long-suffering with Satan. Why not just destroy him? That would ruin the whole plan for what he does in creating beings. He's given them so that they have some choice. He gave Adam and Eve so that they would have some choice, and he's willing to live with that in his long-suffering in that, even to fill his own plan for what he wants to do. I want you to understand there was always a two-way conflict going on. That two-way conflict, and that's what letter B is, it's between two leadership groups, a conflict started by, by Lucifer and one that goes knowing good and evil. Let me see if I can share with you what I mean. The conflict started in heaven. That's that leadership group that started it there. One. And he, he transports it to earth. And now a leadership group there rebels against God. But it's not ended there. Adam and Eve now are living there. Again, heaven decides it wants control of God and sends sons of God, or I shouldn't say sin, sons of God descend, and they have rebellion on the earth again. As if that's not enough, when they're finally all destroyed, people decide then they're going to be in charge again. So now who's going to have the kingdom of God? People. All those who left that ark and had children. There's where the rebellion's coming in. So we want to pick up today letter two in your outline. <clears throat> and let me see if I can uh, get this down. Um, when God says that they have become like us, when he says they are like the Elohim, they are like the gods, he qualifies it this way, knowing good and evil. Not they have become authorities, The way they are like the Elohim is that they are knowing good and evil. Now they know how to make evil choices. Before they were going to live just learning from God, they would know good. But after the fall, they know good and evil. That's going to make them just like the ones, the Elohim, that occupy heaven. Everybody with me on that? I I hope I'm I'm taking for granted that you've, you've... Follow me so far and on the Elohim does not just mean that capital G God. Elohim is little g O D S too. It's simply spiritual beings that occupy heaven. All right. So if I can uh, go on the outline, letter two, numeral Roman numeral two, letter A, the problem. Uh, this is going to be the Tower of Babel and God's discipline of the nations. Here's the problem stated. The people gathered at Babel to be their own authority. They, had, they were rejecting God. They were rejecting the divine counsel. This is what's known as the fourth transgression, okay? or what I'm calling the fourth transgression. The people gathered at Babel. Where did they come up with this Babel? Who would be leading such a group as this? We're told in Genesis uh, 10 and 11 
that it was Nimrod who led them. Nimrod started this place called Babel. All we know about Nimrod uh, from the scriptures or what God's telling us about Babel, that Nimrod, he was a great hunter before God. There's a lot of things to be in that word because that word great hunter means one who gathers things together. So if what I can see, we were supposed to be scattering abroad. Nimrod's battle is to bring things together. That's what his rebellion is. He's going to bring things together. Rather than let people scatter, he's going to bring them together on that plane, that which is called Babel. Babylon comes from that. We'll have a lot more to say about Babylon a little bit later. We have seen as we read Genesis chapter 11 that the people decided they wanted to be their own authority. They were rejecting God. They were rejecting the divine counsel. They decided we'll just do this ourselves. Now, God's going to give them discipline, and that's going to be found in verse 5 and following. So follow me as we go through this. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. They all have one language. This is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So he's looking at them saying, once they're unified, once they know good and evil, once they know how to make an evil choice too, nothing will be withheld from them. In other words, they are going to be depraved. Whatever thing they can choose to do, whatever thing they think to do, they will get it done. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get amazed at some of the things that people have done. When I think of some of the tortures that people have put through, what kind of a mind do you have to have to think that, to even want to do that to someone else? Here's the answer. Mine and yours. Mine and yours. That's all it takes. We have that capacity. It's in us, kids. And there's not a way to escape that. It's in us. And they thought evil things. You see, once they got started on that train, they just added to it. A new car here, a new car there, a new car here, another car here, until finally they were doing things that were so far from anything godly, doing cruel things to one another, doing cruel things to their God. God's going to pour out his wrath. But I want you to see how that wrath is done. He does not strike them dead. Everybody follow that? He's not striking them dead. So before when you think about the wrath, you think it's only going to be lightning bolts, it's going to be destruction. It is not. Secondly, he does not destroy Babel. They abandon Babel. They leave it. And he scatters them out. So if you can, here's what God's wrath is all about. God's wrath, number one, under letter B. The most, the the first thing God's wrath does is this. It lets them have what they want. Let me tell you, you're under the wrath of God when he lets you do what you want to do. Now, if you're doing something you know is so evil and so corrupt and so vile and nothing's happened to you, in other words, you haven't lost your whole family, you're, the, the, you haven't lost your job, you haven't fallen apart, you don't have some rotting disease that takes you down, don't get so bold confident. Our God's long-suffering says you can do what you wish. He's going to let these people do what they wish, just not here. They're going to scatter out. And his wrath being poured out on them is to say, you can do what you wish to do. I'm going to let you. You don't want me. You don't want my leadership. You don't want anything to do with me. I will let you do that. I'm letting you go. You're going to be free. You will not be under me anymore. Kids, that's Romans chapter 1 all over again. That is God's wrath. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness, the wrath of God from heaven. And how does it work out? He lets people do what they want to do. And when they do what they want to do, he takes a step back. He does not resist them anymore. And when they continue to do what they want to do, growing worse and worse in their sin, he takes another step back. He's not going to resist them any further. And when they continue to do what is totally done, he backs out of the way and says, now let it happen. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Always have been, always will. 
If you simply think because you're getting by with something that God's okay with it, you're making a huge mistake. The long-suffering of God is, is giving you opportunity to turn. So that was his first. It's self-afflicting. And you can find that again in Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32. That means you are actually hurting yourself. He's letting you do what you want to do. Secondly, he confuses their languages, separating them into multiple linguistic groups, and get this, and disinherits them. Disinherits them. For this, I want you to go to Deuteronomy 32 again. So go back to Deuteronomy 32. And with this, I want you to listen to this song. I'm going to go ahead and uh, recite this song to you again. You can read it along with me. I want you to see what Moses says here. This song was the song that was given by God to Moses. He is giving you a God-written song, and here's what it says. Give ear, O heavens. So now he's calling on all the Elohim. Stop, Elohim, listen. And all of heaven is supposed to stop and listen. This is not simply Moses speaking. This is Moses speaking God's song. And God is saying to all the hell Elohim, to all the sons of God, to everything that's in heaven, stop and listen. And he's saying to everything on earth, stop and listen. I have something to say. So this song isn't simply for the children of Israel. This song is a song for the world. It's a song for the cosmos. It's a song for all the angels to know. It is a song for all the people to know. Listen to how he says it. He wants his word. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as rain drops on the tender herb, as showers on the grass. Listen, that's just exactly like what was said in Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 had said this, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. So as Moses is reciting what God has to say, he says this, let this word come to fruit. What I'm about to say to you will always be true. It will come true exactly as I'm saying it will. What seeds are in that earth are watered by this word I'm giving right now. What seeds are in the heart of this people who stand before me this day are in their hearts right now and being watered by it. What seeds are found in the divine counsel, what seeds are in your heart today, this word is watering it. This word is bringing forth fruitfulness. Know that I already know you in advance. You might think you have wonderful intentions, but I know you in advance. And this is what you're going to do. This is what's going to happen. Okay? So he starts back. He goes actually backwards in verse, uh, or, or I'm sorry, verses 3 and 4. He says, I'm proclaiming the name of the Lord. This is who's saying it. This is why you can bank on what I'm saying. This is who is the one who is saying is, I am the rock. As he, he puts it in verse 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. So that's the foundation for this statement. Now watch what happens here. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children. Because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who begot you? Has he not made you and established you? This is what God is saying right at the Tower of Babel. This is what was going on at the Tower of Babel. He's, he's going back in history, and in a few moments you'll see exactly why I say that. He's going back in history to look at what happened at the Tower of Babel. He's saying this, you've corrupted yourselves. You are not my children because of their blemish of perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord? He's saying, is that really the way you're going to do? Here, this is, this is 40 years. As a matter of fact, at this time, it's out and up to now 100 years. 100 years they have been uh, rebelling against God, figuring out how to build this city, building a tower, making bricks, making asphalt, doing all the things they were doing to put that all together. He had watched them do that. We are now, at this point, he is 
up to 100 year, 101 year. You say, how do you know all that? The simple was in the word of God. You see, in, in Genesis chapter 10, it told us. In Genesis 11, it told us the sons of Shem. And it told us what age they were when they were born. And it tells us what age they were when they came into this world. And you just add up the ages, and here's what it comes to. At the year 101 after the flood, after the day they stepped out of the ark, year 101, one of the men, Arpachshad, had a son he called Peleg. Was Arpachshad? Peleg. And the word Peleg means divided. And he said, for that was the year that the Lord divided the nations. So he divided the nations 101 years after the flood. That's all it was. Just that short time. Now, going on with me, I want you to follow what he said here. Remember the days of old. He's calling again, heaven and earth to remember this. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Ask your elders, and they will tell you. What do they want? What does he want to know about? When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of, and your versions, I think, are going to say children of Israel. It should say sons of God. Uh, let, me, let me state why I, I'm understanding that. Number one, when God divided the nations, there is a list in Genesis 10 of who those nations were. There are 70 nations that are listed there. And those 70 nations are the ones who are going to be divided. Not in that list is Abraham and Jacob. Why? Because that's not going to happen for another 191 years. And that's going to be the call of Abraham. He is not dividing them according to the children of Israel. He's dividing them according to the sons of God. He's putting the divine counsel that the people at Babel didn't want to have any part of again. He's putting the divine counsel in charge of them. He is disinheriting them, said, you don't want me? Fine. You will not have me. I will put myself in a place that you will not find me. And I will put in charge of you the divine counsel that you did not want. So the sons of God are to be the ones who are in charge of you. And then he's going to confuse their languages and separate them out. So here he's going to take a group that's now going to speak Latvian. If you're Latvian, please, I'm using the illustration. Don't get upset. He's going to take a group here that speaks Latvian, and he's taking them over here. Yes, he's scattering them. He's not counting on time to take them there. The scriptures tell us time and again, the Lord scattered them. The Lord scattered them. So he's taking the Latvians over here, and the Latvians get to have the Latvian-speaking God that's in charge of them, or the Latvian-speaking Son of God, the uh, Elohim that is the uh, divine counsel with them. you got a group that's speaking German. And guess what? There is a German group that they're going to, and as he's taking the Latvians, he's saying, that's your boundary. It's as far as you can go. He's taking the Germans over here and said, here's your boundary, as far as you go. And here's the person who's in charge of you. He goes over here. He takes a, a Prussian group. He takes, and on and on. And he's scattering them out. And a different Elohim, a different son of God, a different member of the divine council is in charge of them. And their boundaries are set. Look, Paul even speaks about this. Let's go to Acts chapter 17 just for a moment. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17. In your outline, we're up to number three. So if you're, if you're looking to see where, what are my blanks supposed to be right now, number two, he had disinherited the nations. And number three is where we're at right now. Acts chapter 17, Paul is at Mars Hill, uh, the Areopagus, and he's speaking to the people up there, and he wants to address them about an altar that he's seen that is addressed to the unknown God. And he wants to explain to them who that unknown God is. So he says in uh, verse 23, um, for as I was passing through and considering the object you worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. And here's what he says about him. 
God who made the world and everything in it. Now, I want you to stop right there. That's something different than their own pantheon of gods did. None of them were the creators. They never said their gods were creators. He is saying there must be a God that's over those. That God who is over them is the one I want to tell you about. He's the most high God. All right. Now, here's we go on. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. So who's Lord over the divine council? Who's Lord over Zeus? Who's Lord over Jupiter? Who's Lord over those? The one I'm telling you about. He, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. Those temples were made to bring a, a dwelling place for that God. It's supposed to bring that God down to it. Okay? So he doesn't live that way. He, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life and breath and all things. Now watch this. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. That's what he said he was doing in Genesis chapter 11. I am pre-appointing where you're going to be. I'm taking you Assyrians over here. This is going to be your land. Stay in it. This is the one who will watch over you. Babylonians, this is your land. Stay in it. This is who watches over you. He's going to do that same thing all around. Egypt, this is your land. Stay in it. This is the, the, the one that's in charge of you. This is on and on. Everybody with me? If you are, kind of go like this. All right. This is what he's doing. He is disinheriting them. He's saying to them, I will not be your God anymore. You don't want me, I will not be your God. Now, go back while you're still here to Acts chapter 17 and want you to read further. Why did he do it? Well, because he's mean and nasty and, and don't, doesn't like people. No. Verse 27 says, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Now watch, he wanted them to seek after the Lord. Now what's he going to do? He's taking his trusted divine counsel, and he's giving them this group of people. You teach them who I am. You show them what I'm about. You show them how to live in the land that they're going to. You show them how to operate the water, how to operate the soil. Why? Because that's what he created in the first place. We were land people. We were about doing land things. Everybody follow where I'm at? That's what we were for. We're to subdue the earth, have dominion over it. We were to land people. That's what we were about. And he's saying to them, you teach them all that. You teach them my ways. That's his trust. That's what he's sending them to do. They won't know him personally. But by the time the divine council tells them all the ways of God, they will seek him. They will seek the Lord. All right? Now, number three in this, he scatters them all over the world, and he sets boundaries for them. That's Genesis 11 and Acts 17, 24, 30, 31. Number four, he puts them under the divine council. And as we've said there, each linguistic group has at least one of the divine council members over them to teach them in the ways of the Lord. Now, if, you go, if you're tracking where I'm going with you so far, this is the basis for all the mythologies and all the theologies, all the different groups of peoples in the world. Everybody with me? That's where it all comes. That's where you get your Hercules. That's where you get your Baal. That's where you get all those other because they were placed in charge by God. Everybody follow me? This is important to get. They are placed in that place by God. He is giving them authority over all of those geographical locations. In the New Testament, when it comes over into Greek, that is the word principality. Principality. A principality is a prince that rules over a palatee, a region. So God has created this whole council, divine council, and in that divine council, some of them have been called principalities because they are the prince over a certain palatee. There was a prince that's over Tyre and Sidon. There was a prince that's over Babylon. There was a prince that was over Persia. There was a prince, everybody follow me? There's a prince that's over China. There was a prince that's over, and I find it most interesting. Oh, um, the first 2,500 years of Chinese history, 
I don't have time to tell you this. This, this is so good. Yeah, I do. The first 2,500 years of China, they worshipped Shidu. They called him the one God, the one creator. And they did things just like the law would do. It wasn't until 2,500 years later that they were introduced to Confucianism and Taoism. So their first group, apparently the prince of that group, was actually teaching them about God, the one true God. There's, there's so much good stuff about that. We have to go on, okay? Letter B. Each group will become a nation with its own geographical region and council member over it. This will be the basis of principalities. This is called cosmic geography by Dr. Heiser. As I've shared with you before, I don't, I'm not original in my thinking. I, I, I am original in my speaking, my language, I create myself. But my thoughts are not. I depend on a whole lot of other people. I have been taught so much by Dr. John MacArthur. I've been taught so much by Ada B. Tozier. I've been taught so much by L.S. Chafer. I have been taught so much by so many people. I don't know sometimes what's my thought and what's not. But I can know this. I'm a debtor to a whole lot of dead guys. There's a whole lot of people who have shared some. I'm, I'm a debtor to a whole lot of living guys. And one of them is Dr. Michael Heiser. And he's the one that's doing the most work in this area. And he's doing great work at this area. It's called cosmic geography. And it means this, that each one of them had their own region. It's only when they rebel, they become known as the gods of that nation. Everybody follow me? They weren't gods until the people made them gods. Until they rebelled against God and said, okay, we will be gods. We'll be just like you. We have our own people. We have our own boundaries. Uh, when, we, when we come to that discussion there, I think you'll see what we mean by geographical boundaries and how important those really were. Um, for those of you guys who are on a Friday morning Bible study, David is, gets kicked out of Israel, and he goes to live with the Philistines. And while he's with the Philistines, he's feeling bad because now he's not under Yahweh anymore. He's under the gods of the Philistines, and he has to serve faithfully, not the gods of the Philistines, but to make sure he doesn't violate the rules of that cosmic geography because the rules of that geography are the ones that he's got to follow. Now, he's not going to, he's not going to live uh, uh, with Dagon. He's not going to follow Dagon, but he is going to do what's necessary, the rules of Dagon, in that area. And he says... I don't have a share now in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of, of, of God's, there, his own special portion. We'll go on. Let her see. The fifth transgression is the members of the council assuming a greater role than given and becoming gods. The people will make images of them and worship them. That's the beginning of idolatry. Idolatry is different from the gods. Everybody follow where I'm at? Now, here's what I mean. An idol is one I build to represent. I'm making an image of my God. Now, I want you to think. God told us not to make images of him. Why? Because we are the image of him. We don't make an image of him. We are it. When he brings Jesus Christ, what's Jesus Christ called? The express image of God. It's alive. It worships God. That's the image of God. When you start making any other image, you lied about God. When you make an image to an idol or a, to, a, to one of the sons of God, you're lying. There is not an image of them. You can't have an image of them. That's man trying to recreate what happened to him at the garden. You can't do that. It's an illegal procedure. And of all the crazy things, it doesn't speak. It has no life. You're going to have to do some kind of crazy ritual to it, and that, that son of God is going to have to do some sort of crazy ritual himself in which he enters that idol and does some kind of crazy speaking to make the thing even make sense. It's 
even though disinheriting them, number five, even though disinheriting them like at Eden, he is full of mercy and is providing them a way of delivery and salvation. Turn to Genesis 12 with me just for a moment. Genesis 12. To think that God doesn't love the nations is inaccurate. To know that he's disappointed with the nations because of their pursuit of anything but him is true. But he still loves the nations, and he still wants the nations. So look with, him, with me what he does in Genesis chapter 12. After he makes this division of all the nations and puts them into the gods, he says this, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of the country, out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. There's that name thing again, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Are you hearing that? Go to Genesis 22 just for a moment. Genesis 22. If God genuinely hated all the nations and wanted nothing to do with them, he would not be doing this. In Genesis 22, pick up at verse 16. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and not have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess all the gate of the enemies. Now watch this. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because that man, Abraham, had obeyed the voice. God's not done with the nations. He is simply done with their rebellion against him. So he disinherits them. But as he disinherits them, I want you to go back to Deuteronomy 32. Aren't you glad you get to go through all your Bible today? Deuteronomy 32. Now pick up on verse 9. After he said in verse 8, that I'm dividing up all these according to the sons of God. Verse 9 says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Are you hearing that? He says, look, I've taken all the nations. Everybody that was gathered right there, I took all those nations and I scattered them out. I've got a, a, one of the uh, divine council over each one of them and all their linguistic and ethnic areas. I've got that all set out right there. But me... I'm going to have a portion too. I'm going to have a place that I'm going to set up my temple with my priests. And that place is going to be Israel. And I'm going to choose Jacob as the one that I'm going to work through. Now, once you get the point, it's not because Jacob is a really honorable guy. It's not because Jacob is really a good guy. It's not because Israel is going to be faithful people. This song is being sung to a people he's already said that when Moses dies, you're going to turn your back on him and go to the other gods. God is going to choose Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of them to be the one he makes a covenant with. Why? Because in that group, that seed that's in that group is going to bring all those nations back again that he disinherited. There has to be a way to bring them back, and this people is the one through whom he's going to do it. He's going to give to this people through Moses a covenant, and I'm going to just share this. That covenant isn't just law. It's about the law they have in that geographical region. Why? Because God is honoring what he did himself. He set up a geographical region for everybody, and he set one up for Israel. He even went so far to say, this is what your portion is. Your kingdom's going to run from here to here, here to here. And the ones that are going to be in charge, you're even going to allot the land according to what I tell you. Why? Because this is my geographical kingdom. He's going to change that when the seed comes that's going to bless all those nations. Now, let me give, let me give you these last ones here. 
He's choosing Jacob as his portion, Deuteronomy 32, 9. In Genesis 12, we see the call and promise to Abraham. We see in letter C, there was a land promised, surrounded by nations of the divine council, then occupied by the nations and their gods. In other words, that Israel is going to become his temple. That's going to be the place he works from. All right, let me go on further with you. Letter D, he's going to change Jacob's name to Israel, a prince with God. He's going to, letter E, out of the land, he's going to put him under bondage to Egypt. All of these things have to be important because when he goes to Egypt to separate them from the bondage, he's going to Egypt to fight the gods of Egypt, not simply the people of Egypt. Yeah, it's the people who put him under bondage, under whose tutelage? Everybody follow where I'm at? Under the tutelage of the gods that were over them. All right, let me go a step further with you. Letter F, there's a showdown and the delivery. That's, the, that's what we know of as the exodus. Letter G, he's going to give the law to correct the account of the cosmos. Now, follow me. That law that was given, it is given to correct the stories about creation that were already being told. The Sumerians had a story of creation. The, the Akkadians had a story of creation. The Ugarites had a story of creation. Sumerians had a story of creation. What's the right one? He is correcting what all of them had to say by Genesis 1 and 2. There was a statement about how people had learned to fall and how people had learned to sin. There were statements about the gods. There were statements about the goodness of the gods that were over them. What has this one done? This is to correct that. The gods are not good. They are evil because they have rebelled against me. This, all of Genesis is part of that Torah covenant. He is correcting all through that what was said by the peoples around them, told by the gods around them, told by the people around them. Those were not true accounts, though they contain parts of truth. We have more to say about that another time too. He says he gave that law until the coming seed to whom the promise was made. Brothers and sisters, that's Jesus. Jesus has come not simply to set the Jewish people free. No, no. He has come to set Gentiles free. Now get this point here. Here's, here's the big kicker. He's come to set nations free. Because he's going to call on his people who are filled with his spirit, who are filled with the message of the kingdom of God, to walk into every one of those geographical regions and announce, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent from trusting whoever else you've been trusting in and put your trust in Jesus, God's anointed Messiah. That's the basis of missions. That's what's going to be happening from then on. Everybody with me? This Jesus we worship has recon reconciled things in heaven and things on earth. He is Lord of heaven and earth. Does this not help you understand when Jesus is given the great commission to his disciples, the first thing he starts with is, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Not just on earth. Not just about saving people. Listen, it's about reconciling all of the rebellion that's gone on among the divine council. He's a huge Messiah. This is big, kids. Our announcement isn't just about ethical behavior among folk. It's about the rescue of folk from lies, from things that have held them in bondage for years. It's about the truth of the kingdom of God. Join me in prayer, please. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we bow before you. We are so grateful to you for all this kingdom that you have given to us, this, this truth about who Jesus is. Father, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who is King of kings and Lord of lords, burn this in our heart that we might be full mouth speakers. The images of God, giving the image of God everywhere it needs to be, giving the gospel of the kingdom, the healing kingdom, the transforming kingdom, the maturing kingdom. Father, grant that we might be filled with that power. And I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.